Life's not fair. While some are born to feast, others spend their lives in the dark. How many of you have dealt with anxiety in your life? How many of you have ever dealt with worry? Fear? I pray that today is a help to you. I pray that it ministers to you. This series, as we get into it in the coming weeks, will continue to get heavier. You guys have been here the last, last week. We just kind of kicked off giving an overview of our enemy, the devil. This week, we're going to dive into how we combat anxiety, worry, fear, those things. Next week, we're going to talk about focus a lot, and it's going to be a special week, so I challenge you to be back for that. The week following that, second week in June, um, we're going to have a couple that's going to join me on the platform, and we're going to talk through abuse um, in a very real, it, it will get gritty, and, and, and I want you to be aware now, I want you to be talking with your kids, making sure that if you have children that are children's church age, you're probably going to want to check them in that week, or it's going to make the lunchtime conversation something you may not want to walk down just yet. Um, and uh, because I believe that the lion is roaring, I believe that the enemy is ticked off. Say amen if you believe that. Amen. And I believe that I want to keep him there. I, I believe that as God has given me the strength to be his follower and his child, I, I don't want the devil to not be worried about me. But if the devil's going to worry about me, then I know he's going to roar around me. And I know he knows my life well enough. He knows the, the traps to lay to get me to maybe go off focus. He knows the traps to lay to get me out of sync with where Christ would have me to be. And so today's message is very near and dear to my heart. I deal with anxiety. I'm not going to dive into a lot of that. But just so those of you know that are here, I, I want you to be aware. I understand Know what it's like to lie awake and have the thoughts running a million miles an hour. And the only thing that the first question does is lead to the next 50 questions. I understand what it means and I understand what it's like to lay there and not know if you can do anything about it. And wonder if you're even the person God could even use to do anything about it. Because frankly, we feel like I'm not enough. We're not enough. That's why I love that song so much here again. That I'm not enough unless you come. Would you meet me here again? And I find myself praying that prayer to God more times than any other prayer. God, here I am again. I need you again today. Uh, I grew up. Now, how, how many of you ever worried about something that was absolutely ridiculous? Like some of you right now, you're worried about the Razorback football season. Just stop now. All right. Just give it up. All right. I know some of you are like, but there's hope. As long as there's an Alabama, there won't be hope <laughs> for any of us. All right. So, uh, hey, guys, we want, I just want to thank you guys for coming out. Those of you that are watching online, whether you're out on, out on the Gulf, we got some people that watch us from some ships out in the Gulf, from Indiana, one coast to the other coast. Welcome to Real Life Church this morning as we dive into week two of When the Lion Roars. I want you to turn in your Bible with me to Philippians chapter four. Um, I grew up knowing what fear was or being afraid. Um, my dad enjoyed scaring me as a child. He's in this service this morning, so I can confess these things openly before him and you. Uh, how many of you dads like scaring your kids? Yeah, I did it to my son Braden the other night. He was in the car, and of course, when it's dark and the dome light comes on, you can't see anything outside the vehicle, right? And so I was walking the dog, and I snuck up behind him, and he was digging around in the car trying to find something, and I grabbed him right here on the back of the leg. And went, Rrr! like that. <laughs> the car's in the shop now because of what he did. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it wasn't quite that bad. My dad, when I was little, my dad's a heating and air guy, electrician, kind of fix-it guy. And my dad always had a flashlight in his tool bag. So my dad's go-to was the flashlight under the chin. <clears throat> make the face, make the noise thing. And the therapy's worked really well for me since those times. Um, but it, we, we get afraid sometimes oh, for surface stuff. But I, I don't, today we're not going to hit on whether you're afraid of clowns or spiders because everybody knows both of those are creepy. All right? Those are givens. Snakes. Some of you are afraid of snakes. We have one gentleman in the church. Why are you in this service? 
He's not in this service. He'll probably be in 1130. He sent me a video last week. He was out on a trail and found a little snake and videoed himself putting the snake in his mouth. What kind of crazy... Uh, God bless him, you know. If you're watching today, Wyatt, I love you, buddy, but don't ever do that again, all right? Uh, so he doesn't obviously have a fear of snakes, but for some of you, that would give you... Like, you just got a little freaked out just imagining what that would look like. So we have these surface level fears, but I want to talk about that today. I want, we're going we're gonna to dig a little bit into what you can do about the things that stop you. And you know what I mean when I say fears that stop you, worries that stop you. They're the ones that they do convince us that we're not enough. They're the ones that make us believe that nothing is possible. Although we serve a God who says all things are possible in this very same book of Philippians. We, we, we stop. Anxiety will stop us. Certain situations will stop us. Some people don't like confrontation. They don't like conflict. And, and so they get anxious in those situations. Some people don't want their kids to not like them. So they get anxious in those situations. How many of you parents know it's okay for your kids not to like you? Say amen. How many of you are kind of glad if sometimes they don't like you? Say amen. All right. We, we have, so, but some people deal with anxiety on that level too, where they go, well, I, don't, I, don't want, I don't want to not be liked. There's a huge people pleasing. Now, and I'll just tell you that our culture screams this. Our culture screams into this fear and anxiety type of mindset. You go online and no one likes anybody. We're right on the verge of everything's going to fall apart and it's going to collapse and we're going to be living in a post-apocalyptic Mad Max kind of a culture if we don't fix things soon and we can start to freak out a little bit. They make it look so bad. Billy Graham had a quote in 1965. How many of you were not alive in 1965? Raise your hands. For the rest of you, how does that make it feel? <laughs> um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need a couple of people to help me out. I just need a couple of volunteers for me. If, and it doesn't matter who. I just need about four or three or four. So jump up. Somebody jump up. All right. Come on now. I just, three or four. Come on this way. Thank you. Come on. Or six. I mean, we'll take six. It's all right. Keep coming. It's all right. Good. Good, good, good. Stand right here. You stand right over here. Slide down just a little bit for me. All right. Stay there. Stay there. Bruce. Scott, you guys come on down here. What's your name, buddy? William. William. William, thanks for hanging out. Love your shirt. I'm a kid from the 80s. So some of you are waiting until he's turned around and you're like, what? Um, here's, here's Billy Graham's quote. He says this. The anxiety is the natural result when our hopes are centered on anything short of God and his will for us. Anxiety starts and forms when our hope is centered anything short of God. No pressure, okay? All right, I know your wife's here today. I'll go ahead and just go ahead and if you'll just call him God the rest of the afternoon, he'd appreciate that, all right? So this is gonna be God. Everybody say, hey, God. Hey, God. All right. So here we got, now here's what happens. What we do is we go, man, Scott's doing well. He's got a great job. His career is going well. But that's going to get him right about here. There's going to be something happen in Scott's life where that job isn't quite cutting it anymore. And he's going to wonder why he placed all his hope and all his trust. And something may happen where that job just comes out from underneath him. Anybody been there before? Where you put that trust in this thing. We put this trust in this thing. And the whole time God is reaching out with his hand going, I'm right here. But Scott doesn't know to reach there because he's reaching in what he's been taught. You take care of yourself. You provide. You do what you're supposed to do. And that will take care of you through it all. But how many of you know that jobs and success will ultimately let you down? That's right. They will. And so Scott does this. He falls short. Go ahead, Scott. Have a seat. William, come here, buddy. William, how old are you, bud? Thirteen. Thirteen. Holy moly, you're a big one. All right. <laughs> so William's 13 years old. William's getting ready. To, so you're going into high school almost, junior high, high school? Junior high. Junior high. All right. So it's about to get crazy. How many of you remember that transition? William, let me tell you. Good yeah. <laughs> you're going to have seasons over the next four or five years, depending on where you're at in that. You're in it going into eighth grade? Yes, so the next five years. Four years, <laughs> sorry. I was good at math, all right? <laughs> Where everything about him 
God is going to be questioned in your life. Everything that you are about to see in culture. And you know what? You can put your hope in your education, which you ought to have a good education, but it's still going to fall short of him. You can put your hope in your job, right, where Scott was, and it's still going to fall short of him. And over the next four years, it's going to be even more crucial that your hope be in him because culture is going to be constantly doing this, pushing you away from him and saying, you don't want that. That's not real. That's a fairy tale. That's fake. When in reality, the only thing that has ever offered consistent hope is God. And so you guys do me a favor. I want you to send William off, but I want you to be praying for William as somebody that's starting this journey. He's got four years to finish it. Let's pray he finishes strong. Amen? Amen. 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 You guys give it up for William if you would. Go ahead. Come here, you two. Aiden, both of you. What's your name, big guy? Ben? How are you, Ben? I'm Vince. Nice to meet you, Ben. It's Ben and Aiden. And we're going to pretend you guys are brothers, all right? It's all right. High five each other like your brothers. A little fist bump action. It's good. All right. Oh, he blew it up. Come on, Ben. Where you at? There you go. There you go. It's a delayed explosion. So come on, Aiden and Ben, you guys walk with me because here as kids, you got not only got the school thing that William had to worry about, but a lot of times we'll pull back and we'll lay all our hope in our family. Well, mom and dad's always going to be there. Mom and dad's always going to help us make the decision. And we'll keep walking this way because mom and dad have always been there to help us. How many of you know there's going to come a season when mom and dad can't answer the question for you? Now listen, if you're 37 years old and you're still living in the basement, stop letting mom and dad ask, answer the question for you. <laughs> All right? Because you need to shift. You need to shift it off them and onto God. Because he's got the answer for you. You just got to be willing to listen to the answer for you. And one of these days, your answer isn't going to come from the people that love you and trust you and, and have raised you up. It's going to have to come from a different answer. You're going to have to find that source in Christ. You guys give it up for Aiden and Ben this morning. Thank you. Is your wife here? She not? Okay, all right. Corey just had a little baby girl. <laughs> Did y'all hear James say, good job, Corey? Like you had anything to do with that. <laughs> your wife did all the work, all right? But they also have boys. You guys, three boys, and just had this little girl. And this little girl didn't have a chance with her brothers, all right? If you are looking to marry off your baby and he's a boy, don't look here because her brothers are not going to allow it. All right? But the same thing, he can put a ton of hope into that family sitting there. He can put a ton of hope into his job. He can put a ton of hope into his wife who's amazing and it still falls short because society goes, marriage is kind of disposable. You don't have to stay it out. You don't have to stick it out. You don't have to stay the course. You don't have to fight the fight. What, you know, it's really easy actually now to just walk away and start over again. Who doesn't like a fresh start, right? Because that's what culture said, just get a fresh start. But you see, there's something now that see, he has to come close to God because Corey, as great as Corey is, and Corey serves with our student ministry, he serves in different capacities here at the church, but as great as Corey is and as great as his family is, it is only a percentage of great as it could be if it's with God. All of us, all of you, me, myself included, I have been blessed with an amazing family. We have six kids that are all healthy. I think all of them are in church in this service. And, and like that doesn't ever happen because there's so many of us. But God has blessed us with this. And all of it, if we keep it out here away from God, then we still fall short. I don't want Corey to fall short. I don't want Heather to ever fall short. I don't want those boys to ever fall short of that little girl who's awesome. And you don't even know, you don't even know how wrecked you are, my friend. <laughs> you don't. You guys give it up for Corey. I'm about to get personal with you, James, all right? James and I have been on a journey for several years. God has been dealing with James. You've been calling him, ain't you? James keeps getting closer, starts walking towards it. All but see, then life goes, wait, 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 you're really busy. You've got some stuff going. You've got some things over here and you've got some things over there. And what will happen is the moment we stop, that anxiety that Billy Graham mentioned in 1965 starts to build. And we start to then, when we stop our path towards God is when the enemy starts building those questions in us about God. Is he really calling me? 
Can he really use me for something like that? Do I, am I even equipped? Do I have the right tools? What, what am I going to offer them? What am I going to share with them? What kind of, I mean, I, don't, I can't talk like Pastor Vance. I'm a little bullheaded. Yeah. <laughs> and the enemy starts whispering and building doubt and anxiety and tension about the call that God is putting in their life. I'm going to tell you, this just doesn't happen to James. It happens to a lot of you. And God starts drawing you closer and you go, God, I want to come closer, but I've got all this stuff. I want you guys to do me a favor. God, high five. Good job. You guys give it a hand for God. This is a super long introduction. I might have to cut some stuff out, but that's all right. Here's what I want you to do. Right now, I want us to pray. And we're going to pray for James. And I'm going to pray for all of you. That is, God is calling you. You keep running towards him. Don't stop when the enemy tries to trip you. Don't stop when the enemy puts a wall up. Don't stop when you think there's an obstacle because it's just the lion roaring. And remember, the lion's a liar. Father, I pray for James right now. I pray that you would continue to anoint his life and the call you've put on him. God, continue to drive him towards you. And not just him, everybody that's sitting in these seats today that's allowed anxiety and worry and fear and doubt to stop them from following your will. God, I pray that you would just strengthen them, gird them up, pick them up, and walk them to the very throne of God. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You guys give it up for James. Re recent survey says this, that... On worry, it's indicated that only 8% of the things people worry about were legitimate concerns. That means 92% of things that, worry, that the people worried about, they could not control, that had never happened, or they hadn't happened yet. We worry about stuff that just wears us out. I, I remember my dad pastored a church up in Ohio, and there was a woman in the congregation, and she, she dealt with chronic worry to the point where if, if an ambulance would drive by her house... She would immediately go to a phone and pick up to call all of her kids to make sure that each one of her children were okay and that that ambulance that just randomly passed by wasn't for one of her children. You go, well, that's kind of crazy. Worry will do that to you. Anxiety will do, it'll take you to places that you couldn't imagine your mind going. How many of you have laid in bed at night and went to bed thinking about one thing only to be driven down the highway of anxiety and wake up with about 75 other worries on your mind because you just went down this road that took you and spiraled you? Anxiety is, that's what it does. And I believe that our culture, our current generation will be known as the age of anxiety because it just drives but Paul wrote something to the book of Philippians, and this is where I want us to be in Philippians chapter 4, starting with verse 7. It says this, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I will say rejoice. Now church, I want you to say this with me, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Now say rejoice like you're actually rejoicing, okay? Like you've got something to be happy about. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, Rejoice! Let your reasonableness, let, let your proclamation be known to everyone. Well, what's the proclamation? The Lord is at hand. Now, here's what we end up doing. We end up as Christians, we, we fight anxiety by saying things like, well, Lord, come quickly. Lord, he, Lord's coming back soon. He'll be back. That's not what this verse says. The Lord, the, this verse says, hey, what you ought to be proclaiming is God is here now. He's with me right now. My, my proclamation is going to be the Lord is here. Not the Lord is coming. That's a given. Not the Lord has helped me in the past. But that the Lord is here in this moment with me now. And in that we can rejoice. We can rejoice in that. It picks up in verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything. Oh, snap. Right? I mean, come on. Why you got to put this verse in the Bible when Pastor Vince just asked us if we've ever been anxious for anything, and now he reads, don't be anxious for anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Verse 7, and then the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your, what's it say? And your minds in Christ Jesus. 
that would guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. When we deal with anxiety, worry, doubt, fear, any of those, the one thing that we're aching for is peace. We just want to rest. We just want to sleep. We just want to be able to get some rest. We just want some peace from the thoughts that run through our mind. So how do we do that, Pastor Vince? How do we, how do we get to this place that in the midst of turmoil, in the midst of chaos, in the midst of this circumstance, in this situation, and these people in my life, and those people in my life, how can I just get to a place of peace? Daniel chapter 6. I'm going to give you some backstory. You can turn there if you want to. I'm not going to read all the passages because it's a bunch. Because most of you have heard the story before. Daniel chapter 6 is pretty popular. We're a little further into Daniel's, uh, uh, his captivity in Babylon. Now just to give you some backstory, Jerusalem was taken captive by Babylon. Daniel was one of the kids taken and he was raised up and they saw that he was a great leader. So the king of Babylon kept putting him over things. Darius would put him over lands and he would put him over management. He would put him over different regions and, and it had gone, gone to the place where he was, he's, Daniel had done so well. That he was going to put him over the entire empire. Well, that caused some anxiety in some other people. And these people began to go, well, we don't want that to happen. And so we need to figure out a way to get Daniel out of the way. And one of them said, the only way that we're going to be able to get Daniel out of the way is to attack his religion. Sound familiar? Does it sound something like maybe what's going on in our culture today? That the only way we can get the Christians to be quiet is to attack Christianity? And say that it's this and it's not this and it's just not right. And why would they believe like that? And they're so exclusive and they don't love anybody really. It's just a big hypocrisy. It's what we're facing today in our same culture. Daniel was facing the same thing. And the governors and the leaders of, that, of Babylon said, we got to attack his religion. So how do we do it? So they went to the king and they blew smoke up the king's robe. Okay. Not literally. That's a, <laughs> somebody just went, what does that have to do with the story? <laughs> um, They went to the king and they're like, hey, you're awesome. This is all paraphrase, okay? Read this in your Bible, not the Vince Daniel version. They went to the king and said, you're amazing. And we need to make a decree that for the next 30 days that you're not allowed to pray to anyone, human or divine. Side note, except you, King Darius. Or you'll be cast into the lion's den. You'll be executed. And Darius liked that idea of being propped up. And... His pride got in the way, and so he signed off on the decree. It says then in the next few verses, and I believe in around verse 20, it gets to the place where Daniel now is praying in his home, and the leaders went and watched him pray in his home, and then they finally got him. They were like, King, he's praying, and it ain't to you. It ain't to you. It's to his God. We need to get him. We need to get rid of him. And the king was heartbroken about this because Daniel was the man, and God had provided it. But, but I signed the decree, and so they threw Daniel in the pit of lions sealed the door with a stone and the king put his seal on it. It's interesting to me that that's not the last time they sealed a door with a stone and put a seal on it and it didn't work. All right. There's another time that comes up in just outside of Jerusalem when they put my king in a hole and put a stone on the door and it didn't stay shut. So we have Daniel now in the lion's den and you go, but that's a bad place. How many of you would agree that being in a lion's den is a bad place to be? For those of you that didn't agree, okay, how many of you agree with being in a room full of toddlers? <laughs> I just want to try to get relatable with everybody, all right? No, these lions were set up to execute. They kept them hungry, and they would kept them divided out, and they would keep them at bay so they could go in and clean the, the, the den, and then they would open that so that the lions would enter, and whatever was in the den, they would eat because they kept them starving. It's amazing how our minds do the same thing. Well, we'll be in our mind and we could be trucking along and having a great day. And all of a sudden it's like that divider opens up and that lion comes in with the thought of you're not enough, or you're, you're doing awful at this, or you're, you're not quite what you think you are, or why do you believe God could ever use you? Or this situation is going to destroy you. Why do you think you could ever stand up for yourself? Why do you have this negative? You don't look as pretty as you think you do in these thoughts. These lions begin to come in to the den. We've done our best to starve them. But the problem is when that divider opens up, they rush in. So they've got Daniel in the lion's den. You say, so what do you do when you're in a lion's den? What do you do when that's the case? Now, according to Scripture, that when when this decree happened, when the king offered the decree, the Bible tells us that Daniel went immediately to his house and began to pray, like usual is the way Scripture says it. 
He went to his house, began to pray as usual. He began to lift up God and say, Lord, I know you got this. Whatever you need me to do, I'm your God. I trust you because you've brought me this far. So Daniel began to pray that. He was still praying that in the midst of the lion's den. I want to give you some things found in the text in Philippians that Daniel exhibits in the book of Daniel. The first thing I want you to walk through is this. The first thing I need you to do, if you want peace in your life from anxiety, you have to have expectant worship expectant worship. You say, but, but Vince, I'm, I'm not one of those hand raising people. I don't like, I don't care how you worship for some of you. It's music. You get Dallas up here. Dallas forgets half of you are here most of the time. And you can tell that if he's got his guitar, then he's bouncing. If he's got, doesn't have his guitar, then he's swinging that one arm around like this while he's singing. And he could care less if you were here. Not that he doesn't care about you, but he is in a moment of worship to an audience of one. And so when we have expectant worship, it's saying, God, I'm going into worship believing that you have a plan on the other side of it. I wonder how many of you show up expecting something awesome to happen at church. You just show up because the coffee's good. I go to sleep. I, like, I get amped. Like, I, it's hard for me to sleep on Saturday nights because I'm excited that I get to do this on Sunday morning. I love that I get to do this. It's, one of my, it's my, probably next to being my wife's husband and my children's dad, this is my favorite thing to do, is to preach, share the gospel, to be in front of people telling them that Jesus is there and that he loves them and he has a plan for them and that they are amazing in the sight of Christ. And so I come expecting 40, 50, 60 people to be at an altar at every service. And people go, (laughs) that's Vince, come on, you're nuts. I would go, you're nuts for not believing it with me. Why not believe that that neighbor that you brought could meet Jesus today? Why not believe that that kid that's been running from God could meet the Savior of the world today and all of it changed? Why not go into it believing that? Why do we go into our relationship with Christ going, I hope it works. I hope, he, I hope he rises on the third day. I hope the cross was real. How many of you know the cross was real? Say amen. How many of you know that the tomb is empty and Jesus is not there? If we know those things, then our worship ought to be expected. We ought to expect God to do something. When we pray, we ought to expect something to happen. And say, well, I've prayed before and it hasn't happened. Here's what I do when I begin to work and, and worship in God's presence. When I'm there and I'm just asking God and I'm praying and I'm worshiping, I'll say, God, I need you to pull me back at about 30,000 feet so I can see what got me to this place. And nine times out of ten, I realize that it has nothing to do with God's ability to answer my prayer. It's had everything to do with my availability to obey his command. And when I don't follow him, why would I expect him to just jump out of heaven and answer my... He's not a genie. He's God. My worship ought to be expectant. Philippians says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Daniel went back to his house as usual and fell on his knees and began to lift up God and thanksgiving to God and worship to God. And I don't care how you worship. Look, I stand on the front row when I worship. I slide out of the office over there and I usually hang out in this general vicinity right over here because that's too long a walk to come around. And I get on the front row and the reason I get on the front row because if I wasn't on the front row, I'd be worried about everybody seeing me you say that doesn't make any sense yeah because my eyes are forward so I don't see any of you so I can lose my mind a little bit over here lady next to me said hey I said can I stand right here by you she said as long as you don't mind bad singing I said just do what I do and sing it loud and I don't mind lifting my hands and pumping my fist and tell Dallas, telling Dallas sing Come on, sing. Miss Olivia standing up there as big as this table, belting that song out like she wrote it. And I'm like, yeah, that's good. Worshiping because God is good. Expecting him to move in a way. That's how you defeat anxiety. Because I want to tell you something. Worship and anxiety can't hang out the same place. Can't happen. You can't be freaked out about what's attacking you when you serve the creator and you're worshiping the, ho- the captain of the host of the Lord's armies, what's going to come at you with God on your side? If God be for me, then who can be against me? So you can't worship and be afraid. 
You can't worship and be anxious or be doubtful. So you got to get to a place of worship. Second thing is this, prayer. We pray. And last fall, we did, an, we did about an eight-week series on prayer. But we pray, and we pray flippantly. We pray quick. We pray, Lord, bless my food. You know, I was taught a prayer when I was little. My dad's a car guy. So he taught me this prayer, going to sleep. Now I lay me down to sleep with a 57 Chevy out in the streets. <laughs> if it rolls before I wake, I pray to your God to put on the brake. <laughs> Amen. I mean, he taught me beyond that too. I, he taught me prayer because there were moments that I'd come home late at night and I'd walk by mom and dad's room and I would see my mom on her knees next to her bed with her hands up on her bed praying for us kids. There were Sunday mornings I'd get up early and I'd walk by my dad's study and I'd see him in his study kneel down beside a desk praying over what God had put on his heart to preach. Pray. Pray like it could do something. Pray like it's going to move the mountain. Not that it could, but it's going to move the mountain. Daniel got in a den of lions and prayed. You say, but yeah, but he was in a den of lions. Let me tell you something. I said this earlier in the first service, and I don't know if I said it in this service. You're going to have thoughts of anxiety and fear and doubt and worry. You're going to have them. Just don't let those thoughts have you. Daniel had those thoughts. He was surrounded by the lions, but the lions had no power. The lions didn't leave. They didn't walk in and go like, I'm not that hungry. You good? I'm good. Let's roll. No, they stayed right there wanting to eat him. Just like the thoughts. Just like the, the enemy walking to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. He wants to destroy you, but he has no power when you're praying. You got no teeth when you're looking to a God who created it all. Third thing, you have to have prayer. You have to have worship. But guys, this is the part we got to get better at. And it's just gratitude. Just having intentional thank you. Daniel prayed and he thanked God when he got arrested. Thanked God when he got arrested. Now, granted, his reasons for getting arrested were righteous. If you pray and thank God for getting arrested and your reasons aren't righteous, that's probably not going to work. Daniel prayed and he thanked God. Thank you, God, for watching over me. Darius, even after it says that Daniel, love this, Daniel slept in the pit of lions and Darius stayed up all night on his pillow in the palace. He stayed up all night freaking out. What's going to happen? What, his anxiety was wearing him out. And he was living in a palace. Daniel's anxiety was gone because he was serving the master in the den. And I'll tell you, I said this in the first service. I'll take God in the den over a pillow in the palace any day of the week. Any day of the week. Gratitude. So Vince, I just need to know how. I, I'm, I'm a Christian. Listen, here, I want you to get this. Peace with God comes at salvation. The moment you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are at peace with God. You, you have this promise of eternity in heaven with Him. You have this promise that says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You have this promise that says He will look at you and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. You have this promise. That's peace with God. But the peace of God, that's different. That's for those of us that deal with anxiety, worry, and fear. We know we have peace with God, but I at times still need the peace of God that passes all understanding to overwhelm me. And that happens with sincere prayer, worship, and gratitude. That's how I find it. That's how I stay centered on it. That's how I come back to it. And some of you worship, you'll stick in music and listen to it for hours and lose your mind in the car. Look like some superstar at the red light. I know, I've seen you. Some of you say, I go to the deer woods and worship. Hold on. If your focus isn't on God completely, then you're not worshiping. So whatever you're saying, be very careful. 
I got nothing against the deer woods. I like them. But if you're not focused on God completely, it's not worship, so be careful. I want you to have the peace of God in your life. I want you to, when anxiety begins to build, I want you to be able to square up to it and go, no, 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 no. You see, I serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. One day he's coming back and he's going to be on a white horse with a sword and you got nothing. You need to walk away. That's what I want you to be able to stand. I want hell to shake when you get up in the morning, not because of you, but because of who is with you. And it'll begin to push anxiety out. Those thoughts that you're not enough will go away because I'm not enough unless you come. Would you meet me here again, God? Would you meet me one more time? I need you. Not for a moment have I been forsaken by God. Not for a moment has he left me hanging. There have been times that's been flipped. Or I left him. I said, I'm going to do my own thing, God. I got it. I got it. I know you're God and all, but I'm pretty smart. Anybody ever been there? Don't leave your preacher alone on this one, all right? And he says, Vince, it's anxiety that you deal with. Those of you that wrestle with anxiety, I get it. I get trying to make everybody happy. I get the stress of that. I get the reality that those thoughts don't let you sleep much. I get the reality that some days you don't feel like you're enough. And in reality, we're not enough. So really, why would we even talk about it? It's just truth. I'm not enough. I can't tell you the amount of times that I've sat in this church building or the barn next door or the bus garage or the school gymnasium and looked around and said, God, why in the world would you call me to do this? I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing, God. I don't know how to do it well. And why would you call me? Why didn't you call somebody else that had the tools, that had everything that you needed? And God's trying to scream through the roar. He's trying to let me know, Vince, you're exactly what I want. You're exactly who I created for this moment. But I can't hear him because the roar, the roar is telling me that I'm not equipped. The roar is telling me that I'm not enough. The roar is telling me that you're probably never going to make it. And at some point, at some point, the carpet's just going to get yanked and the whole thing's going to fall apart, Vince, and it will be your fault. Get it. I get the reality. The enemy screams so loud. And I get everything that he tells you about you. But he didn't create you. So he doesn't get to define you. He didn't form you in the womb and give you a purpose. The enemy can't do that. Only God can that and God formed me in the womb and he gave me a purpose and he defined me and he calls me child he defined me and calls me redeemed he defined me and calls me delivered he defined me and called me his and it will always be enough for you today for you today